CNBC TV 18 present Crypto, Digital Assets of the Future. Hello and welcome to this special series. Wazirx and CNBC TV 18 present Crypto, Digital Assets of the Future. The industry has been a witness to many previous ground shifting eras, including the introduction of computing into banking systems, anytime banking with ATMs, and the internet and mobile technology shifting the mindset to anytime, anywhere. And all that is just a sector example. All sectors today are digital. Blockchain technology, decentralized finance is now operating in very many sectors of the economy. Let's understand the how and how much of this sector. Joining us is Nitin Gore. He's director IBM Financial Sciences and Digital Assets. Nitin, hi. Good to have you on CNBC TV 18. Well, there's just so much to talk about, but I want to begin with the blockchain itself and the use cases. We've seen shipping companies, airline companies, healthcare, mining companies, insurance, all starting into blockchain. There is an adoption that we have seen into the space. Is this enough? Is the pace enough for you? Is it good enough? No, it's not. Uh, we've been at this now for a decade. And uh, in this decade, we have seen the industry transform itself. But we've also seen the industry disrupt itself, both from the outsiders, but also from the inside. So historically, when we start the journey with blockchain, we were trying to flatten the business process, which is all the use cases that you mentioned in supply chain and going after industrial, you know, industrial use of blockchain. But with the emergence of tokenized finance, or as you have laid out as, as, as decentralized finance, we have seen the disruptive forces come into existence. So we still have a long way to go. Uh, and I would say that we are at a, at a juncture where uh, we could see an explosive growth, uh, both in terms of the industry itself, but also the technical innovation that's driving the space. So what you are saying, Nitin, is that we have seen a disruption in the markets for sure. But when you talk about the real world adoption in a complete sense is something that is still awaited. I think so. Uh, I think many projects that I, me and my team globally have worked on, especially in the areas of supply chain, trade finance, going after healthcare industry, we still see uh, minimal adoption in that space. Um, I would like to see a much more flattened business process uh, over blockchain ecosystem. And there are many tech companies and industry alike working on these uh, areas. What we have seen, though, in the past three or four years, an explosive growth in decentralized financing and now we have begun to see the emergence of metaverse, which is convergence of social culture and economic concepts uh, sort of uh, you know, coming to life. So that to me is of course a little orthogonal to the industrial application of these use cases. Though I think I do envision a convergence both, for, you know, for instance, de you know, decentralized financing converging, you know, converging with finance, projects like Helium converging with telco, projects like NFT converging with uh, you know, marketing concepts, you begin to see uh, both the disruption and transformation happening at the same time. You know, Nitin, when this year started, not really started, in the middle of this year, sometime there was a conversation on how the centralized finance and decentralized finance will now start to coexist. I mean, this is the year that would really change it. Have you actually seen that change coming in? The conversations are quite strong and humongous, but how far away are we from seeing both of this coexist? That's a really great point. Um, we have been envisioning coexistence now for over two or three years. This year has been the hallmark event, especially the rise on the demand from institutional investors into the new asset classes that crypto represents. And that not just from a perspective of treating crypto as a new asset class, but also traditional finance adopting um, the various asset classes, which is if you look at the, the lending platforms, the prediction markets, uh, the asset tokenization, the liquidity pools, as we have seen, these are completely new products, but we begin to see an interest from the traditional finance, which is the investment banking and commercial banking space, looking into using stablecoin as payment instruments. Uh, that is, to me, an indication of that convergence. So not just the rise of the industry from a disruptive end, but also embrace, you know, em you know the traditional finance embracing this from a perspective of you know, wide stream or mainstream adoption is something we have begun to see this year. And uh, that's indicative both in terms of the regulatory uh, conversation that we're having with College of Regulators, but at the same time, we have begun to see the mainstream adoption around the world in that space. 
You know, Nitin, I was reading some numbers earlier, and uh, when, when it comes to uh, crypto investment via the institutions, Asia clearly stands tall right now. I mean, 70% of, uh, uh, you know, of Asia is into crypto acceptance here, while Europe is 56%, US at 33%. But that's about institutions within crypto and products. When it comes to blockchain, when it comes to DeFi, do you see similar kind of numbers stand out? There are two elements to this. One is the, what, you know, uh, the venture capital space, which is basically all the investments going both from the traditional VC space, but also from token investment space. And we see that very high, both in the Europe and US space. But the mainstream adoption, which is, I think, indication of where we would like to see blockchain, many of us who got into the space were trying to position this uh, as sort of economic inclusion agenda and, you know, democratizing finance. And that, you know, the numbers that you have laid out, both in terms of, you know, what, what we have seen in Asia, uh, adoption of this uh, of this technology, but also using this uh, you know um, this technology for its you know for its mainstream finance, has been encouraging. And I think to me, it's indication of the widespread popularity, but at the same time, utility of this technology globally. Uh, what we have seen with Axie Infinity, what we are seeing with Stablecoin, and then emergence of various sort of blockchain networks used as not just a rails to move value, but also for payments uh, globally, is essentially what we had envisioned a decade ago uh, in terms of how this will surface. So there are two angles to this. One is investment, which we see a massive rise in investment, both in the Western economies, but also in the Asian economies. But the mainstream adoption of this technology has been very, you know, very high in the Asian ecosystem, which I think is encouraging uh, both from industry perspective, but also in terms of uh, the rise of this, of this space. And then in all of this scheme of things, where do you see India stand? To me, India has nothing but opportunities. Uh, as as you know, as an Indian myself, I, I believe that India has not only a rich pool and source of talent, but if you look at the the rise in 79 plus million uh, sort of new wallet holders and people who have come onto crypto bandwagon have been from tier two, tier three cities, which again is is an encouraging statistics because in many cases there's there's a realization that they would like to be a part of this growing and emerging ecosystem and economy that it, it represents but at the same time take advantage of, of this ecosystem as not just a secondary sort of uh, income source, but also use this, uh, you know, use this technology as an ability to be able to uh, you know, get on the bandwagon. So India to me, not only represents the transactional volume in terms of pure numbers as a country of 1.3 plus billion people, but also a rich talent pool, which uh, I think could be very advantageous to India, not only to catapult uh, its economic systems, but also to be able to attract new capital and sort of, you know, have the economic growth that India needs at the moment. You mentioned about stable coins earlier, and yes, we have seen the popularity grow quite strong, uh, you know, from non-existent numbers in few years ago. Much of that growth really has come in in last one year itself. But, uh, you know, with the call or with the noises, with the, for the, with the ask for more compliance when it comes to stable coins, and the fact that there are concerns, especially with the recent Evergrande issue in China, that how perhaps Tether could be exposed to commercial paper in China, not exactly, not directly to to ever grant, but other commercial papers within China as well. Would you also believe that stable coins perhaps need regulations uh, faster and at priority perhaps? That's a great question. I think that anything that touches the existing financial system, um, and we've been talking in the industry for quite some time in terms of stable coin is nothing but a centralized IOU, which allows you to collateralize the token with the fiat. And the moment you touch fiat, you are sort of touching the existing financial ecosystem and the regulation and, and compliance that go with it. So the regulatory and compliance framework that go with, goes with traditional finance, whether you're tokenizing, has to be maintained. Uh, and I think that's something which we all have been vocal in the industry to say, if you're doing pure, pure crypto, then the entire college of regulators around the world should take a fresh perspective and treat this not just for the lens of existing regulation around the asset classes, but also build new regulatory and compliance framework that keeps in mind the 24/7 nature of this industry and the fractionalization uh, of the, you know of the industry that goes with you know with asset tokenization. And so we we do certainly need new regulatory clarity. But if we are dealing with simple tokenization of existing asset classes, including tokenization of fiat to stablecoin, I believe that uh, that the entities who are involved in these projects and are involved in these transaction systems should adhere to existing regulatory and compliance system that includes. Uh, the 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 FATF led regulation, but at the same time, things like travel rule, things like anti money laundering and KYC, those things have to be adhered to if we were to succeed with the growth and progression of this industry. I think.
You mentioned also about tokenization. Uh, while, yes, this is something that uh, the regulators, I'm assuming, are definitely looking at. But when you look at the corporate adoption of tokenization, what kind of concerns do you see erupting there as well? Well, the main thing around tokenization is governance. Uh, who issues the token? Who redeems it? How do we account for it? And more importantly, how do we coexist with the existing ledger-based system? So the entire uh, economic system that we have built over the last 100 plus years relies upon let's say the ability for us to have a relayed batch relay of, of asset movement. You have a ledger which reconciles itself and then you have movement of the asset and there's a whole sort of chained reconciliation process that happens. And when you bring the tokenized asset in that ecosystem, uh, that existing business process that goes with you know, reconciliation and, and using these ledger entries to be able to connect with each other simply goes away. So there's a technical element of digitization to tokenization that needs to that needs to adhere, but at the same time, I think there are new business models that tokenization enables. You know, namely, uh, real time payment systems, real time movement of assets, which leads to the infrastructure that's needed. Things like you know what we would need for things like anti money laundering or addressing financial crimes, addressing crimes that have risen due to opacity of information due to these batch relay system of the existing economic system that we have in place. So I believe that not just technical advancements in terms of you know, ensuring that we have real-time visibility, accessibility to these transaction systems, but the newer business model due to uh, fractionalization of these, you know, these, these tokenized assets, but also the realization and movement and transaction finality that goes with it uh, are the things that the enterprise, both in terms of financial institution, but also the non-financial institutions, things like you know the supply chain ecosystem and the trade finance ecosystem that's tied to supply chain, uh, I think are some of the impeding factors uh, that needs to be addressed. Uh, Nitin, uh, I really would now love to understand on what is the kind of number that we're looking at when we talk about the tokenization of assets that can perhaps lead to creation of newer business models. But, but, uh, but fractional ownership, how well is that doing and uh, what geographies is it really picking at? So today, the fractional ownership is purely confined to the traditional crypto and DeFi space. This is ability for me to be able to take an Ether or Bitcoin or any of these derivative assets and be able to chop it up into 100 different pieces and own a fraction of that. But it becomes really, you know, it comes really to life when we start looking into things like real estate, which is still uh, just a few handful of companies, both in, in, in the Western world, have addressed it, though it's rampant in India and China. At this moment, you know, at this moment, looking into regulation as to how do you address those, meaning that could you potentially have a fraction of a house that you're investing into, as opposed to buying an entire property in, let's say, New York and giving an avenue for a farmer in Uganda or a middle class sort of, you know, service personnel in India to be able to make an investment into these fractionalized assets, as opposed to buying the entire sort of house or entire asset class that may become a challenge both in terms of affordability. So fractionalization leads to some of the elements. And I think we have looked into the existing economic sort of landscape, which today is $271 trillion, which is the entire sum total of all the bankable assets. Uh, these are commercial papers. These are sort of lending products and these are ETFs and, and the entire ecosystem that we know. But if we were to introduce this notion of fractionalized assets and taking non-bankable assets, these are assets that traditionally are not in the banking ecosystems, we would see anywhere in, in magnitude of 2.4 quadrillion dollars. So you see not just the growth of a larger economic system, but also inclusion of the eight plus billion people uh, in that in that ecosystem to participate in their own little uh, fashion in their you know with their own fraction uh, as the participative economy grows with that. So those are the numbers that we're looking at, which you, as as you can see from 271 trillion dollars to eight point or 2.4 quadrillion dollars is an exponential growth that can happen today by simply including the non-bankable assets that are still things of value that me and you value uh, that are not in the mainstream financial services. All right, when we're hoping and we're looking at those numbers there, but with that, it's time for a very short break. Nathan, do stay on with us when we come back. There is so much more to talk about. DeFi's, NFTs, wallets, that, that, that the subject really is huge. Coming back soon. Wazirx and CNBC TV 18 present Assets of the Future.
Welcome back and we are in conversation with Nitin Gaur. Nitin, thank you so much for staying by. You know, one thing that, that, that again uh, is, is a lot in conversation is that the blockchain and the digital asset space is quite fragmented. We have 10,000 plus cryptocurrencies. We have 100 crypto wallets, 100 and more crypto wallets. And, and, and the market clearly, uh, there are so many exchanges. And then again, there is not one number that people work with. How do you think that this would get resolved going forward? Yeah, and this uh, I've I've written a paper on this topic, okay. comparing this this evolution to what we have seen with internet era, and so internet is all about data and data sharing. While we are now in, you know embarking on a platform that enables asset movement and asset sort of you know transfer, and early days we had five protocols, you know, and eventually Ethernet emerged as sort of the winner, which you know for its advantages and 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 strengths. I believe that, in the, and you're right, it's, it is a, it's a massively fragmented space. And I think my last count was 12,680 plus different tokens and assets classes that are emerging. A dominant dozen uh, sort of layer one protocols, uh, 800 plus different blockchains around the world, uh, 488 plus sort of exchanges and, and tens and thousands of, of, of wallets that are emerging. So how do you muddle through this sort of complicated and confusing space? And I think, that I don't think there'll be a blockchain that'll rule all only because of the fact that there are advantages and there are specializations that each of these blockchains offer. Uh, you begin to see a sort of emergent winners, both in decentralized financing space, uh, using Bitcoin as what has been proverbial gold, uh, as sort of a, a separate asset class using seeing Ethereum as a dominant platform for de you know, decentralized financing projects. We begin to see Solana and Cardano rise as not just challenging the Ethereum's progress, but also uh, being the de facto platforms, both for NFT and some of the DeFi, uh, you know, platforms, flow, uh, which again uh, has been gaining you know, prominence in NFT space. So you begin to see sort of the dominance that each of these layer one protocols are carving themselves for, providing specialization, providing you know the gravity that it attracts the ecosystem in that particular space. To me, I'm not so concerned about the emergence of the specialization because that sort of dictates the innovation that also leads to survival of the fittest in the sense that uh, the platform that provides the best value in terms of speed, in terms of cost will win. But what's more interesting to me is interoperability, is the ability for us to traverse the asset from one metaverse to another metaverse because each of these blockchain represent an economic alignment to the token valuation is how do you, how do you sort of have these blockchains and these asset classes between these different ecosystems interoperate? And I think, Interoperability becomes, to me, the challenge of the next decade is ability for me to be able to move seamlessly without uh, a, a massive technical intervention, uh, the assets between various um, blockchains, but also me and you as common users to have a single wallet and no matter what the wallet is and be able to hold the decentralized financing assets, your identity as a token, your healthcare records, uh, your COVID vaccine records, as well as the non-fungible tokens, the cricket and the baseball and the basketballs, uh, which is our passion, uh, I think that's the world that I envision is the convergence of, of you know, of these all asset classes into into a single sort of custodial or non-custodial, you know, uh, accounts. Nitin, so that can be the next question, really, because, you know, we've seen fungible tokens and we've seen NFTs really grow quite strong as, as it were right now. But much of that really is about art and uh, music. Uh, how do you see the growth of that? I mean, I'm sure whenever something new starts, there is there is an immediate rush to it, and perhaps a couple of things catch up before it before it starts actually showing its use case or utility. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great question, and we've been looking into NFTs from past four years, even before NFTs were cool. There's always a hype curve. We've we've seen the exponential growth in certain phase until the next element comes across, and then things settle down. And I believe that today the majority of the NFT is driven from art and music and, 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 and the whole notion of democratizing and giving a platform for emerging and budding artists and, and musicians to be able to craft and, and remove the middleman you know, from the picture. We have been looking at NFT from the true definition of NFT, which is unique tokens that are sort of uh, defined, they are tied to the uniqueness of these tokens as some of the elements of identity. So identity can be a non-fungible token that it belongs to you. It is very much tied to you. Uh, people can misuse it, but no one can really you know, uh, own it. And same thing with healthcare records. Healthcare records could be a non-fungible token that has use cases where I can suddenly have a lineage of my healthcare record uh, and that longitudinal record 
could be used for uh, medical research, could be used for clinical trials, could be used for insurance discounts. So these are practical use cases that we can uh, adopt in mainstream sort of uh, you know uh, our life. Uh, but in many cases today, uh, we see NFT growth primarily driven from art and music. And some of the, I would say the FUD factor that goes with it is people don't want to miss out on, on, on a wave. Uh, but I believe that this will eventually settle down and we'll find the true definition of non-fungible token emerge, uh, which will be tied to your identity and which will be tied to things you truly value, not purely as a speculative asset. Nitin, I got a lot of answers for you, from you, but you also have put out some questions for which we will await for, with the time for those answers there. Thank you so much for joining us. That was a great conversation. Nitin Gaur, thank you for your time. Wazirx and CNBC TV18 present Crypto Digital Assets.